This is Chemical Processes for Micro and Nano Fabrication. I'm Chris Mack, your professor for this class, and this is Lecture 61, the first part of a two-part series on electron beam lithography. So we've just spent a lot of time, a lot of lectures, talking about optical lithography, which is the mainstream semiconductor manufacturing technology. But electron beam lithography is extremely important for two reasons. One is it is used for mass making. And we'll explain why it has great advantage for mass making uh, as we go through our discussions. Uh, mass making is absolutely critical to optical lithography because we have to start with a mask. We have to start with a pattern uh, that we project. We can't use projection lithography to make a mask, at least not the first mask, because um, you have to start with a mask to project. So how do you make that first mask? How do you make the original patterns that we use in optical lithography to project onto the wafer? Ebeam lithography is, is the technique uh, of choice. Um, but we also use e-beam lithography for many nanofabrication applications because it's great for making one-off structures, one-off devices, uh, for making uh, test uh, materials, because it is a direct write technology. I can build things without having to first build a mask. It makes it very fast, very convenient. It can be driven by a, a design written in software. Um, and uh, it's very high resolution. So it meets many of the criteria we need for R&D, for prototyping, for development activities, um, and, and for university work. So e-beam lithography is extremely popular for these applications. But as we'll see, it's not popular for making chips um, because of uh, some difficulties associated with it. And we'll get into those. First, something about the physics. Um, Louis de Broglie wrote a PhD thesis in 1924 where he posited that particles, like electrons, have a wavelength. Uh, this was not too far after Einstein uh, described light, which we all knew had a wavelength, as being a particle, a photon, it was later called. Uh, but this kind of made a complement to Einstein's idea uh, of photons, particles of light, where in fact there's a wave-particle duality, not just to light, but to particles as well, uh, traditional particles like electrons. And he showed that the wavelength of that particle was equal to Planck's constant divided by the momentum p. So if you know the momentum of a particle, you can say what its wavelength is. Uh, just a few years later, Davison and Germer at Bell Labs demonstrated a diffraction of pattern made from electrons, thus proving, essentially, uh, this wave-particle duality that was proposed by de Broglie. Um, particles won't diffract, uh, but waves do. Uh, so. Uh, this was a great turning point in physics, but it also meant that we could think about particles as waves and use optical principles to guide particles and, in fact, form images using particles like electrons. <coughs> now, the uh, wavelength of an electron is a function of its energy. The de Broglie equation has momentum, but of course momentum is mass times velocity. Uh, if the velocity gets up to uh, towards the speed of light, then we have to create a relativistic correction for the momentum, but that's easy to do. Uh, and velocity, of course, is going to be proportional to the square root of the energy. So given a certain energy, uh, of, of an electron, we can determine its wavelengths. And here's a few sample calculations over a range of energies that are common in e-beam lithography. And you can see it's quite a big range from about 100 eV to 100,000 eV. Uh, and we've, people have built e-beam lithography tools with wavelengths over that full range. And you can see the wavelengths are small. Uh, for high energy, 100 kV, it's, it's less than a tenth 
of an angstrom. And for even down to 100 eV, it's only about an angstrom. So with these very small wavelengths, you can imagine that we can have high resolution if we create an imaging system that uses wavelengths, uh, excuse me, that uses electrons instead of light. And that's what we're going to do with e-beam lithography. Well, in order to do that, somehow we need to be able to direct the electrons the way we want them to go. The way we do that with waves, with light, is to use lenses and mirrors. And we shape the lenses and mirrors in such a way to bend the light uh, and focus it. Well, we're going to need to do the same thing, but we can't use glasses and mirrors in the traditional sense. Instead, we have to uh, apply forces to the moving electrons to get them to change their direction. We can do that electrostatically or electromagnetically. So we apply, um, have a two parallel plates and we apply a voltage across them from plus to minus and uh, that will cause a, a negative electron to be attracted to the plus side and bend its path. Uh, the force uh, given by uh, this equation, uh, Q times the electric field. Um, and the electric field is the voltage divided by the distance between those two parallel plates. An electromagnetic field, uh, we, we take a current and run it through a coil and we create a magnetic field uh, and that bends this uh, uh, path of the electron as well, given by this Lorentz uh, equation Q times the velocity crossed with the electric field. We saw that before in our mass analyzer for ion implantation. So either one of these kinds of, of arrangements can be used to bend the path of an electron. And if we bend the path of an electron in the right way, we can make a lens. To do that, we have to be able to vary the electric or the magnetic field in, in the proper way as a function of radial position. And we make lenses, electrostatic lenses, electromagnetic lenses, and we can focus electrons. And this will be the heart of our imaging system for an electron beam lithography tool. Unfortunately, just like in optics, these electron lenses have aberrations. But unlike optics uh, with light, it is difficult, very difficult, to correct the aberrations. Spherical aberration and chromatic aberration. Chromatic aberration is aberrations caused by different wavelengths. And for the case of electrons, different wavelengths mean different energies. So if we have a distribution of energies of the electrons, which is inevitable, we, will, we can have chromatic aberrations. Because these aberrations are hard to correct, we tend to live with very low numerical apertures. Higher numerical apertures always have larger aberrations unless we do something to correct them. So the way we get around these aberrations is by using smaller and smaller numerical apertures. Well, we know the resolution is going to be lambda divided by Na, some multiple of lambda time divided by Na. So for small Na's, we are not having that good of resolution. Ah, except our wavelength is even smaller, as we saw before. So we can make lambda over Na nice and small, even with a low Na. And that's what we do in e-beam lithography. All right, so let's look at e-beam lithography tools. We need a number of components. Um, first of all, these tools came about because of scanning electron microscope technology. Um, in the, sometime in the 60s, people realized that we can use electrons to do more than just examine or, or look at small objects. We can actually use the beams of electron to modify materials and therefore write patterns. Uh, it is a direct write technology. No mask is necessary. Instead, we have uh, computer-controlled beam blanking. That is, we can turn the beam on and off uh, and, and control where we, we expose with an electron and where we don't. And therefore, because it's direct write, we can control it with software. We use it to make our masks. While the resolution is high, it is not infinite. Right? We've, we've, we still have limits to resolution, and there's three different kinds of phenomena that can limit resolution in e-beam lithography. And depending on the system, we may be limited by one or more of these uh, techniques, and there can be trade-offs. So the first is the spot size. The spot size is the smallest spot I can make on the electron, 
which is essentially um, something like lambda over Na, maybe uh, between 0.5 and 1 times lambda over Na, just like in normal uh, optical uh, imaging. And so the electron wavelength, the lens Na, determines the smallest spot. Typical e-beam lithography tools, um, if they're geared towards high resolution, have, have spot sizes on the order of a nanometer, between a half a nanometer and a couple of nanometers. Uh, but sometimes we purposely make this spot size bigger uh, in order to uh, get faster uh, writing capabilities. There's also electron scattering in the resist, in the substrate. Uh, this scattering smears out the electron images inside of the photoresist, and we're going to talk about that in part two of our two-part series on e-beam lithography. And finally, there can be electron-electron repulsion. Uh, electrons are both are all negatively charged, so if we try to squeeze too many electrons together into a small spot, they will repel each other and spread out. Well, how much they repel is a function of the current. So if I shoot electrons one at a time, then obviously they're not going to have any problem uh, uh, repelling each other. But if I try to put a whole bunch of electrons at the same time into this small spot, that is, if I use a very high current, then I'll get this, this what's sometimes called Coulombic repulsion uh, and a smearing out of the spot size. And this can be a problem depending on the design of the system. We'll revisit these limits to resolution as we uh, continue talking about e-beam lithography. So let's look at our e-beam tools. First we need an electron source called the electron gun that supplies the electrons to the system. Uh, we worry about the brightness of this source, for example, uh, to get high throughput. The electron column, this is the lenses that shape and focus the electron beam. It includes a beam blanker that turns off the beam when we don't want to expose. We have a mechanical stage that positions the wafer underneath the electron beam. We'll see that we have a combination of electrical motion of the beam and mechanical motion of the stage to write our wafers or masks. We need a wafer handling system and a computer system that controls the equipment and provides the data. Now this is a non-trivial piece. Uh, if we want to write a very complicated pattern uh, quickly, then we need to supply a lot of data quickly and e-beam systems can have uh, requirements of into the gigabits per second of supplying data to the tool in order to, to write these complicated patterns very, very quickly. So let's look at the gun, the electron source. There's two basic types that are most commonly in use. There are other types of electron sources as well, but thermal emitters are the most common. This is simply um, uh, like a filament. Here's a, I show a tungsten filament that you heat up in, in a vacuum and electrons boil off so to speak. Um, you have to make it pretty hot and as long as you provide enough en energy to overcome the, the uh, work function of the metal, electrons can come off. Here's another uh, source which is uh, brighter than a tungsten filament called Lab 6. It's uh, lanthium boron, hexaboron. Um, we all just say Lab 6. A tungsten's used in a vacuum. Uh, lab 6 has to be used in a very high vacuum. And here's a tungsten filament mounted in uh, its holder. We can also use a field emitter gun. Here we, we uh, take a, a material and come to a very fine tip. Uh, tungsten, carbon nanotubes, we can even use silicon. We apply a very large electric field to pull the electrons off. So um, we're not heating this up. Instead we use a high electric field to supply the energy required to pull the electrons off of the tip. Brightness of these guns is the difficult thing. How to get highly reliable um, sources that are also very bright. E-beam systems are tend to be tall, kind of complicated systems, maybe on the same order of size as the lenses used in lithographic uh, imaging tools like scanners. Uh, and you can see in, in these two examples that uh, we have both um, plates uh, deflection plates here and here and here and deflection coils, electromagnetic uh, uh, coils to deflect the beam. 
we have um, blanking edges that can be used to cut off the beam, etc. Uh, the light, the source of the electrons is up here. Uh, the wafer surface or mass surface is down here. Whatever we're writing, uh, and we we form spots depending on how we're writing. We can form spots or we can form rectangles or other shapes that we project onto the writing surface. Now, the field size of what we write is, tends to be quite small. We can't write big fields, again, because of the aberrations in these lenses. So we write very small fields. And that means we have to either move the field around or move the wafer around or mask around underneath it. And that gives rise to the writing strategy. There's multiple writing strategies that we can use. For example, raster scan. Raster scan is the simplest, the earliest. It's kind of the way a television screen works in the old days of CRTs, where we scan a beam of electrons across, and then we step down and scan it back, step down, back and forth, and we scan over the whole region. It's very easy, but it's very slow. We have a spot size, which we adjust to be whatever size we want it to be. Then we simply move it back and forth, blanking the beam every time uh, we want to not write a pattern and let the beam on whenever we do want to write a pattern. Uh, makes the software and the stage and the control very easy. But we have this ugly resolution throughput trade-off. Uh, I can get better throughput with a large spot size, but I can get better resolution with a small spot size. Vector scan. Uh, is a little bit more intelligent instead of just going back and forth and blanking the beam wherever we don't want to write. Instead I move the beam to the region I want to write and then I raster scan in that region. Then I move it somewhere else where I want to write and raster scan in that region. The result is uh, usually a faster system especially if we have sparse patterns. I only have a pattern here or there uh, and not a dense pattern that I want to write. And then finally, there's something called a variable shape beam. Basically, we take a rectangle and project the entire rectangle at one time on the wafer. These rectangles are not big, but they're on the order of, of uh, a micron or half a micron in size. And I can adjust the width and height of the rectangle. And that allows me to make a wide variety of shapes on a, in a faster way because the rectangle is quite a bit bigger than the beam. Uh, and yet I still have good resolution because I can make that rectangle small if I need to. Here's a picture that shows some of those writing strategies. So in, in the uh, Gaussian beam system, um, I have a pattern and I can basically think of the beam as little spots. And I, I decompose the pattern shown in the outline here uh, as a bunch of little spots and then I either write it in a raster scan way, I scan along, turn the beam on, turn the beam off, come back, turn the beam on, turn it off, and I go back and forth. Or in a vector scan way, I simply move the beam where I want it to be and I do my scanning inside the pattern, and I can go up and down and back and forth, etc., uh, to fill up just the parts that I want to write. But the fastest uh, way and the way that we typically use for mass making today is the shape beam approach. So I shape uh, a rectangle of a certain size and then I expose it in one shot. Then I change the shape of the rectangle, move it and expose it in a second shot, a third shot, etc. So I break my pattern up into rectangles uh, called shots which I then expose one at a time. And this tends to give uh, the fastest results uh, and a better trade-off between throughput and resolution. There are many commercial systems out there. Most of them are R&D uh, related, some geared specifically to universities, some to research labs, and some for mass making. So JEOL, or Joel, makes a couple of systems um, uh, for the R&D community and for the mass making community. Um, I believe they're the most popular for mass making, although there's other tools like Nuflare as well. And Wraith makes a system for R&D with a variable energy, which is, has an advantage. Uh, and uh, there's also software you can buy that would convert your SEM into an e-beam lithography tool. That's quite popular um, for research departments on a budget.
One of the ugliness of e beam lithography when we think about it for manufacturing is this trade off between throughput and resolution. And we'll see later that this is not unique to e beam lithography, but in fact is a difficulty that we see in many lithography strategies. To get high throughput, what do we want? Well, with Gaussian beam systems, uh, either raster scan or vector scan, we want a larger spot size to get better throughput. For the uh, shape beam systems, where we're projecting a rectangle, we want larger address grids uh, so that I can use just a few rectangle shots and not lots of uh, small rectangles to fill up the shapes. Um, both of those result in less resolution. We also want high current. If we have high current, we can move faster. We either move the beam back and forth or we move the stage. We can typically move the beam back and forth over a small region, maybe 100 microns square. So the, the, the stage will be stationary and will write back and forth the beam, but only over a 100 micron square region, and then we step the stage to a, a, a new place. So we want high current so we can write very quickly, and we want a fast stage. But both of these things have problems. Higher current results in this coulombic repulsion that we talked about, smearing out the patterns. And a faster stage is also harder con to control, but that's a man more manageable problem. The result is high throughput always results in lower resolution, and higher resolution always results in lower throughput. Uh, one way to approach uh, solving this, besides just better engineering, which only gets you so far, is to use multiple beams, and that'll be a topic of a later discussion. So. What have we learned in Lecture 61, our first lecture on e-beam lithography? As always, you should be able to quickly and easily answer these questions. If not, go back and review the material. How can electrons be used to form an image? How does that work? Name two common ways to generate electrons for an e-beam lithography system. What are the main writing strategies we use in e-beam lithography? And lastly, explain the resolution throughput trade-off. Next time we'll talk about electron material interactions, scatterings that occur, and photoresists and how they work in e-beam lithography. Till then.